So I will present File Bounty, which is a fair data and value exchange protocol with automated dispute mediation. So given the hash of a file, File Bounty enables a, far, a fair and secure exchange between a buyer and a seller. So I will tell you a bit more about what that means. If you want to sell a digital good and you know the hash of that good, then you're actually able to do that securely in a trustless manner without any additional assumptions than just knowing the file hash. So the actors are Bob, the buyer, Sarah, the seller, and the smart contract. The buyer knows the file hash. This is a very important assumption. The seller owns the file. The buyer is willing to pay value V to get the file, to buy the file, and both of them have deposits in the smart contract. So the background to understand file bounty are hash functions, in particular the Merkle Domgard construction, and uh, later on we'll talk about the Sporch construction if we have more time. There's also game theory, so the protocol is proven. We have a proof that there exists a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium, which means that um, what we consider is the correct uh, course of action for actors is proven to be a Nash equilibrium. So it is the course that rational actors will take. So let us talk about the Merkle Domgard construction. So it's what's used for MD5, SHA1, SHA2, so it's the, more, the most uh, frequent one. So you define a compression function, F. You define an IV, an initialization vector, and the file F, you split it in N chunks, from C1 to Cn. So this is how it looks. On the right, you see the file from C1, C2, Ck, Cn minus 1, Cn, which is split in chunks. And on the left side, you see the compression function f, which takes a file chunk and the previous state. So let's zoom in. At the very beginning, I will take the chunk C1 and the IV Together, I put them in the compression function F, and that will give me H1, which is the intermediate state of the hash function. I will then continue the process. So I take H1, C2, the chunk 2. I put them in the compression function, and that gives me H2. And at the end, after having done that up to the very last chunk, I have Cn and H of n minus one, the intermediate state up until that point, and that gives me the final hash of the file. So you can ask me, why is that relevant? Well, this is the key insight in file bounty. I realized that by reversing the merkle domgard process, you can actually use that, you can use the compression function as a proof of knowledge. To be more precise, a limited knowledge proof of knowledge. So you only leak the 64 bytes uh, or so of, the, of, of a chunk at most. So let's be, let us be a bit more concrete. So if Bob knows the file hash, then the seller, Sarah, shows that she knows the rest of the file by simply giving the intermediate state just before the end of the process and the file chunk and giving Bob this actually convinces him that she knows the file because there's no way she could have produced those two pre-images unless she actually knew the content of the file. This is because the compression function is pre-image resistant, which is a key feature of secure hash functions. Bob then verifies that F, so the compression function uh, applied with H to the minus one, C, uh, Cn, actually gives the file hash. If that's true, that, that means that she actually received the correct hash, the, in the, the correct file chunk, sorry. So we have the illustration here again. 
if I provide, with, if I provide you h of n minus 1 and c of n, you apply to those inputs the compression function, and that gives you the hash, that means that what I've given you is correct. So this is this proof of knowledge that I was talking about. And you can know that you can recursively apply this insight to the whole file. And we do that by incrementally sharing the file backwards. So we start with the end, and then Sarah, the seller, will share the file chunk by chunk to the bar, Bob, and Bob will at each time verify that the chunks that he's given are the correct ones. So this means that the check is automatically checked for integrity. So that's an overview of the protocol. You see the buyer on the left. He knows the hash of the file. The seller owns the file. They enter a setup phase on chain, so they will put each a deposit of equal amount to the smart contract, and the buyer will also put a file value, essentially the price of the file, to the smart contract. Then they enter an off-chain file exchange phase, what we just discussed, chunk by chunk. More concretely, the seller sends the buyer the file chunk C of K, but at the very beginning, it's C of N, the, very, the chunk at the very end of the file, plus the intermediate hash H of minus one, the state just before the end of the hashing. And the other way, the buyer will sign an acknowledgement, A of N, saying, I have received the chunk CN. This is very important. We then continue the process up until the end where the seller sends the last file chunk, which is at the very beginning of the file since we started from the, from the end, C1 and the intermediate hash H of zero, which is the initialization vector. And the buyer sends the final signed acknowledgement A of one. Once this has been done and both participants are okay with the result, so then they simply go on chain again and get their payoffs. So you will see that the buyer then has the file because he has all the chunks from C1 to CN so he can reconstitute the file. And both of them do a simple on chain transaction to get the deposits back and the seller gets also additionally the file value. So you might wonder why we need deposits. There are two negative outcomes we need to prevent. The first one is that Sarah, the seller, would run with the money. The second is that Bob, the buyer, would run with the file. So we need to protect both participants. And also, I just would like to remind you that we assume that both Bob and Sarah are rational actors, which means that they will not do, uh, they will not be willing to lose money irrationally. So how can we protect the buyer? To protect the, the buyer, we must punish the seller if she does not send a chunk or does not send the correct pair. If you remember, that pair is the intermediate hash of the state just before and the chunk at stage K. So if the seller does not send chunk K, then the buyer must make a claim that he didn't receive this chunk. This is a, a claim that he must do on chain. The seller then has some time to provide the pair to the smart contract, and the smart contract will then verify that it will hold that, that f of ck h k minus one equals h of k, uh, which means that the smart contract enforces the rules of the protocol. In the case there's a dispute, of course. Like if there's no dispute, there's no need for that mechanism. Now the second uh, case is when the seller sends an invalid chunk k, which is a very similar case. Uh, so we treat it identically. identically. Uh, but there is a small difference. We could actually have the seller sign each chunk, 
but we don't do it because it would be a bit less efficient, so it's easier to just regroup those two cases in one. So now, how can we protect the seller? So that's the case where we don't want the buyer running away with the files without having to pay for it. So to protect Sarah, the seller, we must punish the buyer if he times out, does not answer. Because there are some cases where if what you're interested in is not necessarily the whole file, but just a part of it, it's possible that once you've received the chunk that you're interested in, that you just time out. So we must make sure that this does not happen, because otherwise that um, would change the game theory behind the protocol. And also, we must make sure that the, the, if the buyer acknowledges a chunk he doesn't receive, that he gets punished. So this is very confusing, but bear with me, I'll try to explain why. Um, this is something we actually realized later in the second iteration of the protocol. So to protect the, the seller, if the buyer times out, the seller claims that the buyer is offline, so that's why I told you you have to do that on chain. The buyer must answer within some given period of time, and if he answers and says, sorry, I was offline, but I'm back, then we resume the protocol. There are also other courses where we could uh, still um, stop the protocol there, but then we would need to slash the deposits. So if the buyer acknowledges a chunk he has not received, then we need to punish him. So maybe let me uh, remind you that once, that when the buyer receives a chunk and the intermediate hash at each stage, each step of the way, he sends back an acknowledgement saying, I have received it. So this is the case where he receives the chunk and acknowledges it. That's the correct, uh, correct case. But if he, receive, if he receives it, and if he doesn't receive it and acknowledges it, then we must actually avoid this case. Uh, the reason is that he would otherwise always acknowledge uh, that he received a chunk, although he didn't receive it, which would then incentivize the seller not to give the chunk, because he knows that by <laughs> because he knows that the, the buyer, by, by not acknowledging, will lose his deposit. So then the Nash equilibrium would be that the seller doesn't send and the buyer actually ac uh, accepts. And then in the end, the buyer would lose the file value, but at least they, they would get to both keep their deposits. So that would be the Nash equilibrium for the buyer. I know it's very confusing, but that's actually something we want to avoid. And so what we have to do is something really quite clever and, and surprising is that we need to punish the buyer in case of false acknowledgement. So how we do that concretely is that if the, um, the buyer signs an acknowledgement of a, a chunk he didn't receive, the seller knows that the buyer doesn't have it. So what the seller can do is make a claim on chain that the buyer doesn't have that chunk and, and actually challenge the, the buyer and say, please, Bob, show me that you have this chunk. And since he won't be able to give that, that proof, he will lose his deposit and the seller will make it. And that means that this changes the, the, the Nash equilibrium and that means that the, 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 the buyer won't do this. So I know this is very confusing, but we, this is really to show you how far it can go when you actually do game theory off-chain. So, I don't want to go into too much detail, but this is how the game three looks like. So you can see it's a bit complicated. Um, but essentially, um, we removed the case where the, um, the, the, the buyer acknowledges a chunk he doesn't receive. In all cases, what you see in the end in those boxes are the payoffs. Uh, they are separated between deposit payoff and file value payoffs. And um, we have proven that uh, the protocol as it is, is a uh, Nash equilibrium. So let us go through an example of a successful run. So that means both parties are honest and we go until the end. Bob is looking for the file with 
the hash f of h. So maybe you found out on some torrent website and you know that the file that you're looking for has this hash. So, so Bob actually puts a bounty online saying, I would like to get this file, but nobody's giving it to me, so I'm willing to pay one ether for it. And then Bob and Sarah get matched. So Sarah says, all right, I have this file. I'm willing to send it and get paid for it. Both of them put deposits onto the smart contract. More concretely, Bob puts the deposit plus the file value, and Sarah puts the deposit in the smart contract. And then we start the, the protocol once both of things have been done, and uh, Sarah sends the very end, the, the chunk at the very end, and, and gives also the intermediate uh, hash to Bob. Bob verifies, confirms it's okay, and then gives the acknowledgement. We do that iteratively until the end, and then um, Sarah sends the last chunk, Bob checks, says it's okay, and then they go on chain again, get the deposit back, Bob gets the file, and Sarah gets the file value, so, he, so she has been paid for it. So let us go um, with the case where Sarah cheats without having the file. So Sarah sends a pair, uh, Cn h of n minus one to Bob, but this pair is invalid, so Either there was a mistake um, with her computer or she tried to get away with something that is wrong. Then what Bob does is uh, after checking, he sees that they are not correct because he just applies the compression function to those values. He sees it doesn't match the, 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 the hash of, of the file. So then he claims on chain that Sarah cheated. And uh, since Sarah doesn't have the file, and since the compression function is pre-image resistant, there's no way that Sarah could be able to generate a pre-image, uh, can call it AB, such that F of AB equals the file hash. So most probably she will time out because she knows that, she knows in advance that the smart contract will not accept, so there's no point in her making an, an on-chain transaction. If she does make an on-chain transaction with the false data, then the smart contract will just say, sorry, what you sent is just wrong. And uh, in either case, she gets zero. And Bob gets both deposits. So he actually gets uh, Sarah's deposit. Because of course, we have to punish Sarah in that case. So let us see uh, the case where Sarah cheats, but, uh, but having the file. So let's assume that the protocol is executing correctly up until then. And at chunk k, then Sarah stops sending. So in our book, going offline is actually considered cheating because we need participants to be online at least for the, the, the duration of the transfer. Of course, we could have some, some delay, so it could be one day or seven days, and it would just need to happen within that period. Um, but there is a time after which if you don't respond, then you're considered malicious and we have to punish you. So to come back, the protocol executed uh, correctly. We are at chunk K and Sarah stops sending. Then Bob claims that Sarah is offline, so Bob makes an on-chain transaction saying Sarah didn't answer. And then it is up to Sarah to answer on-chain uh, and prove that she actually as the file chunk k. Because, and this is very similar to the previous case, but in that case, she actually knows it. So what she will do is um, prove that she has it. And what's weird is that in that case, they will still both lose their, both lose their deposits. So this might look a bit weird to you, but this is very important. And you can then ask, but why would uh, Sarah still go on chain? Um, is because she, she will still get a share of the file value. So she's still incentivized to go ahead because otherwise you would have the buyer being able to cheat the seller. So as you can see, we always need to think about those cases and make sure that in every single step of the way, we protect both the buyer and the seller. So 
Maybe I'll recap quickly. So Sarah answers on chain and proves she has the pair. The smart contract verifies that the pair is correct. All right. And then the smart contract slashes both deposits and distributes the file value according to how many uh, chunks have been sent. Um, so this is a case where Sarah cheated and uh, both lose the deposits, but there is no reason, since they are both rational actors, that, we would, that it would go that way. So under the assumption they are both rational, this will not happen, as it's written here. So let's look at an example where the buyer tries to cheat. For example, he times out. Then we had a case where the protocol execute correctly until the point where the chunk K is, is not acknowledged by Bob. So then Sarah claims on chain that Bob timed out and Bob answers on chain. And then in that case, we actually have to give the participants the possibility of resuming the protocol. Um, we can also decide to, to slash them both, but uh, then it would not be fair. So we actually have to do that, and that actually means that there's a timeout element to the protocol. If both continue, the protocol resumes, and if they stop, they lose the deposits. So that's how we solve it in practice. So let us go through the applications of file bounty. So remember that for the secure and fair file exchange to take place, we need the buyer to know the file hash. So that happens, for example, in BitTorrent. So if you think at the Pirate Bay and all those turn websites, they actually index files by the hash or by the hashes. So that means that you can directly use all the information that's on the internet to know, I would like to download this file, which is maybe on the Pirate Bay, but nobody is seeding that file anymore, so nobody can actually send it to you anymore, or nobody wants to because nobody has an incentive to. So what we can do is then create a global marketplace to incentivize trusted and integrity check file exchange. Another use case is a backup, backup system. So let's say you have all your data, you hash it, you then send it to um, a data store, they store your data, then you can trust your data, and they can send it back to you and you can pay for it. And you can do that in a decentralized fashion. So that's one way you can do it. And another use case which uh, I heard of recently is bill of lading. So in the case of logistics, in freight, when you have two containers, or like just let's say just in the case of one container that needs to be sent from A to B, the value of the container is contained in a file. And this file contains the value of the container, which means that if I have this file, then I'm the owner of that container, the legal owner of that container. So what we could do is use file bounty to progressively send that file, that, by, that bill of lading, as the container is moving closer to the destination and that would reduce the risk of both parties because you don't necessarily want to have um, the, the owner of the container getting paid without delivering it but you also don't want to deliver without getting paid. So maybe a better solution is to have something a bit more progressive. And the thing is there is that we can use the properties of hash functions to verify at each step of the way that it is actually the right file. So in the future, um, uh, we are thinking about abstracting the model and generalizing. I will tell you a bit more about that. And we could also think about using zero-knowledge proofs. Um, at the time of the writing of, of the file bounty paper, they were not efficient enough, but uh, as of this year, it might be an interesting approach. And uh, I'm also um, looking for new business models to incentivize sharing. And then the, the last point is uh, something that actually comes back to the counterfactual talk, it was just two talks before. Um, 
I think that it is possible to create a multi-party protocol for complicated smart contracts like chess. So essentially, Counterfactual is trying to incentivize the crowd, if you want, to punish someone if someone makes a wrong claim. And uh, what I think is that it is actually possible in cases of, of games that are adversarial, where you have different payoffs, but you have actually a deterministic function, function f. In our case, it was, function, it was a compression function, but it could be just the function of the rules of the game. If we are able to actually split this function in, in smaller uh, state transitions and also have uh, an efficient memory system where we can only show the right data and just the right state transition to prove that the other cheated in a game, then we could do very complicated adversarial games off-chain. And it would be a very similar construct where we'd have deposits on both sides and then they would just interact directly, sign what they have computed, and if you sign something that you have computed but it is wrong, then the other party could be um, simply going, could go to the smart contract, show that you have signed something wrong, and the smart contract would just check the minimal state transition proving that what you did is wrong. So this is a, a direction that I would like to explore. So thank you very much.